It now on to the medieval society, beginning with the estate society. In the Middle Ages, there was an estate-based society, which meant that there were different population groups that enjoyed different levels of status. There was no social permeability, meaning a peasant could not rise to become a nobleman. He were born into this class. This formal society was also seen as predetermined by gods. Now, the hierarchy in a state-based society, in a medieval society, the Christian god was at the top of the list and was also the point of reference for people's entire lives. After him came the king or emperor chosen by God. He was the most important man in the state and had the task of defending the country and maintaining law and order. Below him stood the rest of the nobility, with their barons, princes, and counts, who usually received that territory from the king in which they ruled, but were still subject to him. Then came the clergy. Clergymen, for example, bishops and priests, who prayed, held services, and performed baptisms, weddings, and funerals. The nobility also included the knights, who provided security by protecting themselves and the other estates of going to war. Below them were the townspeople, who were not farmers, but traders or service providers, such as shoemakers or roofers. At the bottom of the hierarchy were the peasants. They were divided into free peasants and serfs. The free peasants were the property of the king, had to perform military service, out land, and were free people. In contrast, serfs were the property of noblemen. They did not have to perform military service, but they did not own land and were generally unfree. The serfs had to pay at the nobles with goods or money and had to perform personal service for them. Although peasants and farm laborers made up over 90% of the population, they had no opportunity to participate in politics and were completely at the mercy of the nobles. People whose profession was considered dishonorable, such as knacker or shepherd, were also outside of the society. Now, in the feudal system of the estate-based society, there it was based on the landing of one's own land, meaning the king or emperor was the owner of all the lands. He could now land his land to the nobility and clergy for life, who had to swear allegiance to him in return and support him in the event of war. They thus became his vassals. They in turn passed the land on to farmers, who cultivated the fields and paid taxes to their feudal lords. They swore allegiance to him. If a vassal received land from the king, he had to provide knights in case of war. The number was determined by the size of the land, granted on the number of peasants. Now, the life in the countryside. As mentioned, over 90% of the population in the Middle Ages worked on the land. In Norman times, many English villages had two large open fields divided into long strips. Each farmer was given some of these strips in both fields. Every year, the farmers cultivated one of the fields and left the other follow meaning that nothing was grown on the field and only grass grew on it. The farmer's animals could then gaze there, and the soil was supplied with fertilizer by the animals. The next year, the cultivated field was left follow, and the abandoned field was cultivated. Each village also had a communal area, where the animals could gaze. In winter, however, there was not enough food, so most of the animals had to be slaughtered in autumn. They were preserved by sorting them, and were eaten or sold. Now, the landlord and the peasants. The landlord was the most important person in a village. He owned the fields, and the peasants had to pay him taxes in order to be allowed to work on his land. 
most peasants were unfree, which meant that they were the property of the landlord, and were not allowed to make any decisions themselves. For example. They were not allowed to leave the village if the feudal the lord did not want them to. During harvest time, the unfree peasants had to do extra work on the landlord's fields. The farmer's grain was ground in the feudal lord's mill, for which they had to give him a share. If her daughter married, her father had to pay money to the feudal lord. If the father died, his son had to give the best ox or cow. To the feudal lords, the bailiff of a village ensured that everyone did their work properly. If a dispute arose between farmers, the landlords settled the dispute. Now, talking about cities and trade in the Middle Ages, beginning of the life in a city, major changes in agriculture, such as three field farming, the plow, and the introduction of new tools. And strong population growth enabled new towns to be founded. These were usually built near streams or rivers, castles or palaces, churches or monasteries, at crossroads, and or near Roman towns. Medieval towns were usually built according to the same principle. A town usually had four gates, pointing in the cardinal directions. In the center was the market square, where farmers could buy and sell goods. It was surrounded by a large town hall and a church. In the neighborhoods, there was craftsmen who offered their services in their own houses. The inhabitants of all neighborhoods had to defend their own section of the city wall in the event of an attack. The inhabitants of the town were also part-time farmers. They kept pigs and chickens in their houses. There were fields outside the town and gardens in the town where they grew food. There were groups of people in the city who were not protected by the law. These included undertakers, Jews, actors, musicians, prostitutes, and executioners. In a city, the merchants who became rich through trade were the most important people. They set the taxes and laws and tried to ensure that no one cheated or stole from anyone else. Craftsmen were skilled workers who made shoes, vessels, hats, and so on. The most important of them were those who owned a shop, the so-called masters. However. Every craftsman began as an apprentice who lived in his master's house and learned in his shop. When you were old and skilled enough, you became a journeyman who was paid by the master. Every town in the 13th century had a guild for each main trade sector to which the craftsman had to belong. A group of masters were leaders of the guild and regulated how a product should be made, how much it should cost, and what the apprentices should be taught. They gave money to members when they were ill and paid pensions to widows. The wool and clothing trade. English wool was the best in Europe. Lords and abbots kept large flocks of sheep and became richer from the wool trade. Merchants who brought and sold wool had large houses and wore expensive clothes. The richest merchants sold wool to Flanders, today's Belgium. The king himself often borrowed money from them. After the 14th century, cotton clothing was made by farmers in the countryside, which clothing merchants brought the wool to the farmers. Who spun the linen and wove the clothes? They received wages for this. Shortly after the 1300s, the quality of English clothing, in which wool merchants in Flanders, Spain, and France improved, the export of wool fell and the export of clothing rose. The money earned from the sale, which was not passed on to the farmers. Was invested in the construction of churches 
some of which still stand today.